Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And here we go with another impromptu podcast, don't we? We do. <laughs> it's Father's Day. You always find a way to get a podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's like a mailman. No, sleet, rain, snow, yep. holidays. None of it matters when you have to get the word out, right? That's right. There's no <laughs> stopping us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a kind of exciting announcement that we woke up to this morning, and that was an article about temple building in the Daily Mail. It was kind of amazing because it made me think back to one of our very first podcasts about temple building where we said, oh, I wish somebody bigger would pick this up or pay attention. And I feel like that's kind of happening now, don't you, Landon? I do. And he, yeah, my, uh, the, the author Miles uh, did a great job on putting that together. A uh, very well uh, done article. Yeah, it really was. And there's a little surprise in the article that we'll, we're going to go through some of it um, in our slideshow later that we'll save till then. It's an Easter egg. But the reason we decided to podcast about this and kind of related topics around temple building is some of the things brought up in the article were why now? Why is this happening? All of a sudden, temples have been being built for years, centuries, right? And I've kind of alluded to it before, where I said I felt that the Hinckley era, and by that I just mean kind of the past, that era, um, it was different, the way they approached temple building. And they seemed to take kind of pride in fitting into neighborhoods. And I've made that comment a couple times on different podcasts. And I've had people reach out through email with different ideas and theories and information. And so I really want to shout out to all of you that have contacted us about that idea of a different vision for temple building in the Hinckley area, because it really kind of gave us the idea of doing this podcast tonight. So thank you. We love it when our listeners and our viewers reach out to us. And so this is going to be pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, it was definitely a kindler, gentler church back then. Uh, <laughs> Not to say it didn't have its problems. Uh, you know, we've found that all the way through the church's yeah. history, but it uh, certainly uh, in relations to PR and, you know, Hinckley himself was a uh, a person who was highly into public relations and, and really knew how to, how to spin a story, I guess mm -hmm. you could say, or yeah. how to treat uh, people to make a, the church look good. He realized how important that was. Uh, I don't think we see that with the current administration. Uh, it's uh, more of a, you know, lawyerly go right at you, throw the book, be as hard case as you can and shove it down your throat uh, kind of approach. It is. And I wonder if the fact that they have the weight of so much freaking money behind them. Honestly, they did not have that kind of money in these other eras that we're talking about. There is so much money. They can do whatever they want. Well, I think Hinckley had the money. It kind of all, you know, started growing under his administration. Uh, you know, it had started earlier than that, but uh, under his administration, it really grew. grew. So right. he definitely had the money behind him. But I think I think he understood people a lot better. Uh, you know, for being a doctor, you would think Russell Nelson would have a lot better bedside manner than what he has. <laughs> but, you know, it's been he's 100 years old. It's been 50 years since he's practiced medicine. I, I guess he's lost uh, that bedside manner if he ever had it. Well, and as we also know from his journal entries in, I think it's Heart to Heart. It was a book at um, Deseret Book. He's also had that highest ritual of the second anointing for 50 years. Last week, I think he mentioned that. So I think when maybe you've had that kind of a carte blanche, maybe you have a different perspective that you're a little bit above everyone else. I don't know. Yeah. You don't have to answer to anybody when you're right. already uh, guaranteed the highest level of the celestial kingdom. So that's right. I think he wants that for everyone, but Everyone else is what he'll argue. <laughs> Yet only the rich need apply. <laughs> That's right. Only the rich need apply. All right. Well, let's dig into our slideshow. We've kind of given you a little idea of what we're going to discuss. Um, see, I wanted to call this uh, the shifting vision of LDS temple building. And here we have a picture of President Nelson and also a picture of President Hinckley to represent the two eras. However, Landon had a different idea. <laughs> yes, I wanted to call it dueling prophets. Uh, it, it reminds me of the 
dueling banjos. Yep. No, I get it. I think you're not wrong on that. And they just keep going back and forth faster and faster to see who can do it better and better. Yeah. That's great. Absolutely. I I think that uh, unfortunately, you know, with Hinckley having passed on, Nelson gets the last word uh, and and doesn't get to have the comeback from Hinckley. So that's right. uh, as a result, he's taking great advantage of that, I believe. Yeah, I think that's true. I think AI did a pretty good job here. I put in President Nelson and President Hinckley LDS playing banjos. And that's not bad. If no. you squint your eyes, it really does look like that. It does look, <laughs> does, does have a resemblance, no doubt. <laughs> Has a resemblance. That, right. All right. So we're just going to kind of talk about the vision of both eras and see if we can kind of figure out why what's happening in temple building today is happening. Try to make some sense of it. So we came across an article that came out in 2018, but it's talking about the past 20 years of temple building. And so this would be barely when Nelson had been put in, I think. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think that's it. Either. Monson had just barely passed away. Yeah, it was just at the beginning of his era. But the article is called President Hinckley Dedicated the First Small Temple 20 Years Ago This July. Here's why it's been a game changer for the church. So this is a trip down memory lane um, talking about President Hinckley. So you can read that, Landon. There's a picture of President Hinckley. Yeah, I think anyone who lived through that time is well aware of President Hinckley's you know, message about small temples and how mm-hmm. he was going to to build a lot more of those. And this article's about that. So it has been two decades since the first small temple, a concept developed by President Gord B. Hinckley in 1997, was dedicated in eight dedicatory sessions on July 26 through 27, 1998. The 11,225 square foot Monticello, Utah temple stands on 1.33 acres of land in the small namesake town in the state southeastern corner. One of the first three smaller temples announced by President Hinckley in General Conference in October 1997, the other two were Anchorage, Alaska, and Colonia Juarez, Mexico. The Monticello Temple was the first of the smaller temples to be completed and served as a prototype for the new design. (laughs) Now, that's interesting because you don't do a prototype on doctrine. So if High Steeples was a proto, you know, was a, Right. A a doctrine, you know, here you are doing prototypes on designs to figure out if the temple design was always part of the doctrine and it's been doctrinal as to what they have to look like. Why are you doing prototypes? I've I've just never heard of prototype doctrine before. (laughs) That is a very good question. And it is. It's a smaller temple. It has a lower profile. And when I was growing up, I heard this all the time. And I think I've mentioned it on podcasting before. There are going to be small stake center sized temples on every corner, right? To prepare for the temple work in the millennium. The land is going to be dotted by smaller temples. I heard that growing up well before Hinckley. Did you ever hear that? You're younger than I am. Oh, yeah. Nope. I heard that. And Hinckley just reinforced it, you know, that they're going to lots of smaller temples so that every community had access to them Mm -hmm. is what my understanding was. Yeah. And it's interesting because when we hear these city meetings about the temples that are being built now, more and more we're hearing about access. We're hearing about people worried about youth driving long distances to do baptisms for the dead. We just heard that in a dedication of a temple, I think, in Brazil from Elder Runlin, who said now, you know, dangerous driving or difficult, difficulty in getting there, this takes care of that. So that's kind of Hinckley's vision. And I can read this next one. Um, In recent months, we had traveled far out among the membership of the church, President Hinckley had said, again, they're looking back 20 years, during the announcement in 1997, I have been with many who have very little of this world's goods, but they have had in their hearts a great burning faith concerning the Latter-day work. They love the church, they love the gospel, they love the Lord, and want to do his will. They are paying their tithing as modest as it is. Huh. They make tremendous sacrifices to visit the temples. They travel for days at a time in cheap buses and on old boats. They save the money and will do without to make it all possible. They need nearby temples, small, beautiful, serviceable temples. So he saw a need as he traveled among the people for what he calls small, beautiful, and serviceable. And this Monticello temple right there, like you said, prototype. 
Yeah, it was the first one. I, I kind of laughed when he said, you know, that they uh, that many who have very little of the world's goods because they've basically given it all to the church. Yes, who you has don't a have the world's the goods because you're world's paying your goods, and now they're using it to force <laughs> these down everybody's throats. Um, but, uh, but that's another podcast. <laughs> that's another podcast. Uh, but uh, this goes back to one of the things I said, you know, he said they travel for days at a time in cheap yes. buses and old boats. He makes it, oh, the sacrifices they're making to get to the temple. And yet we hear now when they're building these giant ones, our kids have to drive 30 minutes to get there. Yeah. You know, it used to be a badge of honor. And now it's, oh, we need to have them right there nearby. So uh, it, it's, it, it just seems to not quite fit in. But it, it is true. If you had smaller temples, you could have them in uh, more places and located closer to the to the membership. So I don't. I don't disagree with the idea that if you're going to do these, that, you know, closer and smaller makes more sense than building these giant and the, the giant temples are not following this plan because you, you look at like Fairview, it's literally 30 minutes from the Dallas and mm -hmm. there's one in Houston and there's one in uh, what, this is the seventh one in Texas. So, you know, they are there, uh, if you want to get them out, you can say Texas is a big place. Yeah. So make smaller ones and spread them out more right. evenly uh, seems to be better. And it fits in better with the neighborhoods. Yeah, I think that's true. Let's see what else President Hinckley said. All right. Go ahead and read that. He proceeded to explain that 30 smaller temples would be built in Europe, Asia, Australia, Fiji, Mexico, Central and South America, Africa, Canada and the United States. This will be a tremendous undertaking, he said. Nothing even approaching it has ever been tried before. Not only would the locals be scattered through, not only would the locales be scattered throughout the world, the temples were to be built immediately. The direction to build smaller temples came to President Hinckley while he was traveling from Colonial Juarez, Mexico to El Paso, Texas. In a church news interview reported on August 1st, 1988, President Hinckley recounted the experience. I reflected on what we could do to help these people in the church colonies in Mexico. They've been so very faithful over the years, and yet they've had to travel all the way to Mesa, Arizona to go to a temple. The inspiration for a smaller temple concept came to the prophet's mind. Ding! <laughs> like a light bulb, right? <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. And I'm throwing in pictures of our smaller temples that don't have spires. Not all of them were proposed or announced by President Hinckley. I'm just going to try to show you guys that there are these temples that fit in. And there are some being created today. But again, just the overall vision of this era seemed to be going toward sort of a smaller, simpler, more accessible temple. Um, he said, I concluded we didn't need the laundry. We didn't need to rent temple clothing. We didn't need the eating facilities. Well, I disagree there because that was the funnest <laughs> part of temple trips, getting to go to the cafeteria that, you know, that was my favorite part. Uh, I agree. That's that was what you looked forward to. Was it to end so you could <laughs> yeah. go get something if to I eat could, and sit and talk? Yeah. If I could just get past this weird part where I'm 15, I'm in a see-through white outfit. There's lots of guys <laughs> looking at me. If I can just get past this, I can go have some pudding. <laughs> That pretty much sums and, up my temple. And that was the one place in the temple you could really socialize. That's right. You could talk out loud without a weird hushed whisper. That's right. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, these had been added for the convenience of the people, but are not necessary for the temple ordinances, right? So he's focusing on, you know, bare bones. What do we need for the ordinances? So he, let me get this straight. He says, let's get rid of the stuff that aren't necessary for the temple ordinances. Oh, that might be like a spire or something right. that is not something necessary delayed, for the temple yep. ordinance. Yes. Yep, and delays the construction of the temple for whatever reason or takes longer. That is a very good catch there. Uh, President Hinckley recognized that the necessary elements of a temple, those of eternal significance, could be housed in a smaller structure than what had been in the past. The small structure could be built in a shorter amount of time at a reduced cost. Well, there it is about money too. The Monticello, Utah Temple completed just a few months after the announcement. Now, that's something you don't hear. Completed a few months after the announcement. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would say that I think they they announced this, but they probably already had the design. They already had, yeah. they, they're precasting these and uh, moving them in. It's what they're doing with the Cody Temple. Yes. They bring in these parts and they're planning to just throw them up. And this was 
you know, they announced Anchorage, they announced, uh, I think, Colonial Juarez, uh, and they announced Monticello. But they chose Monticello as the prototype because it was close to Salt Lake. It was in right. Utah, and they knew they could push it right through. Yep. No, I'm sure you're absolutely right. Uh, the Monticello Temple completed just a few months after the announcement became the first of the smaller temples to be dedicated. You're right, Erlanda. Originally completed in 1998 to be only 7,000 square feet, the maiden small temple had less than half the floor space of a typical church meeting house. So like I was taught when I was little, there's going to be little smaller temples everywhere. To put this in perspective, the meeting house adjacent to the simple temple site had 18,000 square feet. That's really funny. <laughs> yeah. You always hear, oh, the temple has to be bigger than the stake center. Right. It's got to be taller. It's got to be bigger. No, yeah. it doesn't. It that not not according to President Hinckley, it didn't. And yeah. this was a revelation, we're told, uh, that Hinckley had. So, yeah. again, we've got a prophet saying it doesn't have to be large. Yeah. Uh, despite the smaller square footage, the smaller temple design has been effective in bringing essential ordinances to more members around the world, especially in locales where access to a temple has been limited. Today, close to 50 temples are approximately 10,000 squ square feet, the typical small temple mold. Although all the smaller temples have a similar footprint and size, each has unique details in the interior decorating, art, glass, exterior stone, and positioning of the spire. In Monticello, the community quickly outgrew the temple's capacity. Only five years later to the day after the ground breaking, the temple was rededicated. Renovations took the temple from the original 7,000 square feet to 11,225 square feet. If temple ordinances are an essential part of the restored gospel, and I testify that they are, then we must provide the means by which they can be accomplished, President Hinckley said in his announcement in 1997. All of our vast family history endeavor is directed to temple work. There is no other purpose for it. The temple ordinances become the crowning blessings the church has to offer. I can only add that when these 30 or 32 are built, there will be more yet to come. Hmm. That sounds like he was looking ahead to this kind of being, like you said, the prototype, the mold. Well, you've got a prophet of God stating that there are going to be a lot more of these. And uh, I guess we should say that they're not completely dead. We're still seeing some of the mm -hmm. smaller temples. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it's certainly not the uh, mass envisioned by President Hinckley. Uh, we should state Cody T Temple is only 10,000 square feet. Um, the issue with Cody isn't the square footage or even the height of the building itself. It's the height of the steeple that yep. goes clear up to 110 feet. And the lighting is the other issue. But, um, you know, there are still some smaller temples, but the 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 majority of the ones we're seeing now are way taller than all, you know they're in the 85th percentile now of temples that have been mm -hmm. built with their heights and their spires so yep absolutely and you made a good point landon when we were talking before even though they are smaller and you kind of touched on it here the spires are always gargantuan they're huge and that's where they get into trouble in the, with the town ordinances tiny temple like cody but the spire so tall <clears throat> So we found another article about this same topic because we thought it was just really interesting to kind of just take a look into the past and see what was the perspective, what was the vision for temples, according to our prophet. And this is from a BYU Studies article, and this goes even further to describe President Hinckley's inspiration as a revelation. So it says, President Hinckley's revelation and recent temple building. The title right there says it's a revelation. Um, I think it's a, it's an article that has several parts. So it does say chapter one. I'll just start. Um, briefly reviewed the course of Latter-day Saint temple building leading up to President Gordon B. Hinckley's momentous revelation received at the time he participated in the Juarez Academy 1997 centennial celebration. Temples built earlier during the decade had ranged in size from about 34,000 to 70,000 square feet. So big temples, but hardly building any, right, in comparison. Like they were yeah. big, they were mega, but there were not very many each year. Um, okay. Since that time, oh, did I miss that? Yeah, temples oh. built earlier during the decade had ranged in size. Okay, I said that 34,000 to 70,000 square feet, and it had taken a long time to build. Since that time, many small temples resembling the one in the Mormon colonies of northern Mexico have spread throughout the world, 
from the prophet's simple experience. So here they are calling that experience he described in the last article, a revelation from God to a prophet about what temples should look like. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that, you know, the second of the small temples, that's the Anchorage, Alaska temple. Uh, you look at that one, it doesn't have the massive several hundred foot uh, spire. It's, it's relatively modest uh, compared to what we're seeing. Small temples dot the earth. A pebble dropped into a pond causes ripples which grow in size until they fill the entire surface of the water. President Hinckley's inspiration while visiting the colonies in 1997 has had that same effect. Since that momentous occasion, over 60 of these small temples have been built, and they can now be found on every inhabited continent. Hmm. At the General Conference of October 1997, when President Hinckley announced plans to build small temples, he suggested that initially... They would be located in remote areas where the membership is small and not likely to grow very much in the near future. Are those <laughs> Wait, who live remote areas? Remote areas, <laughs> yes. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Are those who live in these places to be denied forever the blessings of the temple ordinances? The president answered this question by announcing, "We will construct small temples in some of these areas, building with all of the facilities to administer all of the ordinances for the living as well as the dead." We are determined, brethren, to take the temple to the people and afford them every opportunity for the very precious blessings that come of temple worship. Ground was broken for the first of the small temples at Monticello, Utah, November 1997. After being pushed rapidly to completion, it was dedicated only eight months later on July 26, 1998. The second of these temples at Anchorage, Alaska, came about six months after, and the Colonial War as Mexico Chihuahua Temple was dedicated about a year later in 1999. So the fact that these are getting pushed through so quickly indicates that they're not facing uh, zoning issues mm -hmm. uh, where they're being built at, that they're getting pushed through as quickly as they are. Yeah, and they keep focusing on the ordinances and giving people the opportunity to do the work. And so the building kind of takes its cue from that, right? They want to get it put up. They want to make sure they can build it quickly. Their focus is on having people go through the temple. And it reminded me of this perspective on temple building that, you know, the concept that people are waiting in spirit prison, right? If you haven't had your ordinances done on earth, if you never had the opportunity in this life, you're waiting in spirit prison for someone to do the work for you. So doesn't that say to everybody that you need to get these temples, these smaller temples put up quickly so that everybody can go in and do this work for everybody that's waiting, right? It's a, it's a big pressure. It's the reason people do it. Well, it, it's funny because he talked about pulling out the uh, the laundry, the, yeah. you know, the cafeteria. the cafeteria, all of these things. And yet now what we're seeing is they're adding in now, not only do the, you know, they're adding in two baptismal fonts, <laughs> exactly. uh, you know, they're, they're adding things in there that, uh, you know, some people say, well, that's for the ordinances, but is it really so busy that they need two or is that mm -hmm. that they need to get the youth there more often so that they can, uh, you know, uh, teach them younger and get them that more mm -hmm. often uh, to to this way? Yeah, I think we have different perspectives when they say membership is growing. We've we've got to accommodate our membership when, of course, anecdotally, we hear from everywhere that, you know, sessions are not very attended. It's so hard to get people to work there. You know, it's pretty much the opposite. So I don't know, maybe the truth is somewhere in between. Um, the BYU Studies article goes on to say, these original three small temples had a floor area of about 7,000 square feet and included just one room for presenting the endowment. This meant that a new session could begin only every two hours. These buildings also included a celestial room, one ceiling room, and a font for baptism. So very bare bones, like you said, but exactly what you need. Uh, beginning with the Columbus, Ohio Temple, which commenced construction in April of 1998, the plan was enlarged to about 11,000 square feet. And that's right around Cody. And I think Bakersfield, right, is about that size, too. It's a smaller. Uh, yeah, it's we, a smaller one. I'm, I'm not sure what square footage that we one We need to have this memorized. We have to know this off the <laughs> or a cheat sheet, right? The sizes of all the temples that we cover, right? Um, let's see. This enabled the temple to function more. Oh, it added another ceiling room and a second endowment instruction room and some of other facilities, which enabled the temple to function more efficiently. 
Now sessions could begin about every hour and 15 minutes. With the announcement of the Columbus Temple, as well as, well as temples in such locations as St. Paul, Spokane, Detroit, and Edmonton, it was apparent that these smaller structures would not only serve saints in small, isolated areas, but that they would be built in some larger centers of church population as well. So the neighborhood temple, it's going to be good for everybody. Yeah, it's kind of funny that Detroit is getting a small temple and Fairview <laughs> is getting a large temple. And again, the algorithm by which they decide this. Now, I believe that when we were growing up, everybody thought the membership would cap out and then you'd be rewarded with a temple. But we absolutely know that is not the case now because there are building temples where the membership provably is teeny tiny. Yeah, and and... It's clearly not large in Fairview. It may be in some of the surrounding cities right. is the argument they're making. It's, yeah. you know, they're larger, but uh, yeah. still now you're putting the large temple in the small city, uh, which yeah. is exactly the opposite of, of what we're seeing under Hinckley. Yep, it is. And again, the confusion with McKinney built in Fairview is that it was originally slated for Prosper and then moved probably to avoid strict codes in Prosper. But Anyway, it's all very interesting. I wonder what President Hinckley would think about all this. I don't know. Uh, wait, there was one more paragraph. Sorry, at oh. the very bottom. I didn't finish reading. Um, it said, if you go back oh. one, there you go. A third group of these small temples beginning in 2001 with the Columbia River Temple in Washington State. That is my temple. My name put there by my parents is in the capstone written on a rock. Oh, really? Yes, I've never revealed that to anybody, but it's there. <laughs> yes, and I have a piece of that temple foundation that they gave to everybody right next to me here in a cedar chest by my podcasting couch. So I don't know if that's a claim to fame or what, but I'm just I'm just saying that's my temple. My and I do know that everybody was so thrilled to have that because we would have to go up to Seattle and we would also have to go to Spokane or something like that later. So um, let's see. Okay. All right. Let me finish reading here. Let's see. Da, da, da. Enlarge the plan to about 16,000 square feet, thus further enhancing their efficiency. The saints regarded some of these temples as specific fulfillments of prophecy. Speaking at a conference in Grants Pass, Oregon in 1924, Elder Melvin J. Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve. So this would have been uh, uh, Ballard's uh, grandfather, um, declared that a temple would be built one day in the Rogue River Valley. A temple was dedicated at nearby Medford in 2000. When a chapel was dedicated in a Columbus, Ohio suburb in 1991, the stake president emphasized the importance of temple attendance, at that time requiring an overnight drive to Washington, D.C., and prayed, help us to realize that as we attend more regularly, the temple could move closer even to our doorsteps. The Columbus, Ohio temple, also dedicated in 2000, was built next door to this very chapel. As had been the case in the colonies, the saints were blessed as they participated in or even just witnessed the construction of their temple. In the southeastern United States, the young women set goals to be sealed in the temple as they helped assemble crystals in temple chandeliers. In Detroit, Michigan, as primary children looked out the window to the temple being built next door, they often sang, I love to see the temple, and eventually saved enough pennies to contribute $200 to the temple fund. Yep, those are all the activities that go on around temple building. They definitely get the community involved and the community invested. Yep, so now I found some charts here, which I thought were really interesting. Just that we're not going to, of course, read every temple, but it kind of gives you idea. There's a whole list of all these small temples announced by Hinckley, and I didn't really realize this is what was going on. Did you realize this? That what that they were building smaller temples? Yeah, that he had announced like 60 small temples starting in 1997. Oh. And they were, you know, I think I just wasn't paying attention. I had toddlers. <laughs> yeah, I knew he'd I knew he'd promised the smaller temples and that they'd be uh, you know, going out to the smaller communities. Uh even here in Utah, you know, some of the further out communities uh started to get temples that hadn't had them before. Uh, because like you said, it used to be you had to have a certain number of mm -hmm. of members before they would build a temple. And some of these towns were so remote, there was no way they were going to get a temple uh, based on the size. 
Yep, that's true. So this kind of lists the first group, about 7,000. And as they mentioned in the article, some of those have been remodeled to include, you know, a few more amenities and gone up in size. We can just kind of skip through these slides. So here is the second group. These are about 11,000 square feet. So this is a list. I mean, if you're very curious, you can freeze the podcast and you can read through these. But I thought it was really interesting just to see their announced, their completion, where they are, and know that they're all part of this group, this vision of smaller temples. This revelation of smaller temples. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Revelation of smaller temples. That's right. Let's go to the next slide. Yep, there's another part of the list of the phase two. And then we go to the third group, and these are increasing in size, 17,000 to 19,000 square feet. But still, compared to a lot of the ones <laughs> that we see now, this is nothing. This is very yep, small. These are very small. Yep, very small. So, but, you know, probably you can see your own temple, whoever's listening or watching on this. But, and, but what it goes to show is there are literally, uh, you know, what, 60 or so temples that clearly would fit into these neighborhoods yes. that would fit into the zoning yes. as is if they just keep the steeples at about 60 foot height. Yep. These buildings, their height fits. And if they keep the lights dimmed down that they don't have to light them to the hill, these temples would fit into these neighborhoods. If you want to go into a residential neighborhood. If you want to go larger than that, you should not be going into the residential neighborhoods. You should be going into the commercial and business districts because then you're getting into uh, large buildings. That is such a good point. There are so many here whose footprint and height and lighting could be easily fit into any of the locations of the temples that we're following. That is such an interesting point. And not only that, all of these temples have the prophetic stamp of approval through Revelation that this size is acceptable. Yeah, they could take any of these 60 footprints probably and put them in uh, and make them work in these areas that, that are being contested. But the church won't do that. They mm -hmm. now, all, all of a sudden, the whole message has changed from small t temples uh, with, with more of them to more gigantic temples everywhere you go. Yeah, and it's true. We keep hearing over and over these adjectives, you know, the height of the wall, of the spires and the walls and the mass of the wall. Just these these adjectives that just make this these massive descriptions of these temples, which are so different from everything that we saw here from President Hinckley. And does not describe these other temples at all. Exactly, exactly. Which again, had the prophetic stamp of approval when he announced those 60 temples that we just saw on that list. So another thing that Hinkley, President Hinckley did that I thought was really interesting, and I will say that one of our viewers or listeners emailed us just last night, I was putting this together and my email's like, ding, and it's somebody who sent an email at exa about exactly this topic. So whoever you are, you were inspired. And we really appreciate those of you that do emails with information. So this person reminded us that in Hinckley's era, they actually converted existing buildings into temples. For example, Vernal, and Copenhagen, there's the one that was near um, my house before, which is the Provo uh, Tabernacle converted to a temple. And also Manhattan, you know, just right there, for meeting house right within it. I know that's being remodeled right now, but that's kind of interesting too, because the footprint already exists. The people already know it's there. And some of these are charming. The Vernal one, I think, is very charming. It's funny when you look at the Manhattan Temple, here you are in Manhattan, the place where height is not an issue. And they, yeah. And this is the smallest yeah. temple with the well, short spire. <laughs> well, no, they fixed that because as we've podcasted before, there is a meeting house connected within that temple. And that those wards are now going to another church. They're sharing it with another denomination where the pastor is LGBTQ. They have to walk in through pride flags. So that's another interesting podcast, but they are remodeling this. And the plans I've seen more gold, you know, ornaments, taller. They're definitely putting some kind of spin. They're giving it the dippity do uh, treatment. So it's going to look different. Well, this, this very, th this, uh, the reason I like this Manhattan Temple uh, picture is because it demonstrates this is what the church is trying to avoid. 
They mm-hmm. don't want a large, tall building like that one as their neighbor. Yep. But then the neighbors don't want a big, tall building <laughs> like the temple <laughs> as their neighbor. It doesn't go both ways. <laughs> and the church says, we don't care. You know, it's more important what we want than what you want, which is a very unchristian attitude, uh, which just blows my mind. And in, in the end, the church is trying to do say, we don't want ugly, big, commercial buildings next to us. So we're getting out of commercial zones and going into the res- residential. Right. And then they're all, you know, they're acting like they're persecuted when the residents say, we don't want big, tall buildings next to us. So why aren't the LDS bigoted against people who build large, tall temple or buildings next to them? Because that's all, that's all these people are saying. They don't care what the building is. They're saying, we don't want something that big in our backyards. And they have every every right when they move into a residential neighborhood to think that. Um, It's interesting to me, too, uh, Heber Valley Temple is building this 90,000-square-foot monster in this small mountain town. Right. And when we went up there, what did we see? We saw that there was the old tabernacle up there, which now is the city hall and was converted to the city hall when the church wanted to tear it down. There was a fight to save it because it's a pretty building and it really fits in with the pioneer heritage. You know, something like that could have easily been turned into a temple um, and could have served the local people right there in Heber. But the church decided to go with this massive 90,000 square foot uh, thing that's going to completely dominate the valley and not fit in at all. So it's, it's interesting to see that what they've done in the past seems to no longer be acceptable. Yeah, that's true. And when I look at the Provo Temple, we've been down there. It's it's in a commercial district, you know, cute little center street, lots of shops and things. And it did used to be a tabernacle. Um, I used to attend state conference there. That was my tabernacle until it burnt down burnt down. I have a story about that, (laughs) 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 which I won't tell here. Um, But yeah, and then the renovation project process on that um, was incredibly expensive, what they did. It's basically a process that they that they reserve for like the most valuable buildings in Italy, ancient, right? So really no reason that I can understand why they did that. I, I think it's sort of a destination wedding temple, maybe to alleviate Salt Lake a little bit. But you know, when you go inside, I did go to the open house there and it reminds me of Hogwarts. It's got all these staircases and it's all wood. And yeah, it's interesting. But again, you know, kind of fits in there. It's in the commercial district and it's a repurposed building. Uh, I, I think they blew the efficiency budget on this one, though, uh, where oh. they said smaller yeah. efficient because they yeah. literally put this thing in like a bathtub mm-hmm. to make it earthquake proof that, yep. you know, estimates are they spent about a billion dollars. Yep. A billion dollars. This. Yeah. Yep. No, they did. It, it, this And I lived down there at the time. So I drive by and watch. They basically put the whole building up on stilts, you know, took the brick off and then built around it, dug out around it, but left it there, built a watertight bathtub around it and then filled everything in. Most of the rooms and things are underground. And then they put every brick back, which again begs the question why for this tabernacle and why other buildings they just routinely tear down. In fact, I went to a fire site about this building when they were about halfway done. And there were missionaries, a senior couple that had been called there to keep the journal and write the history of what was happening at that temple. And they said, you can ask us anything except for two things. And we're all like, what? You know, because it was a Q&A. They said, you cannot ask us about the post office because they were in a fight with the post office next door trying to annex the area, right? A post office, a U.S. post office. (laughs) Then you can't ask us about how that's going, and you can't ask us what it costs. So by saying that right there, we all knew it's got to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And this was before we knew the money that the church had. You know, this is decades ago, so... And, and this is one thing communities have to understand. When the church builds a temple in your community, they don't just build the, the temple. Once they've built the temple, they control what happens around mm-hmm. that temple. They will buy mm-hmm. properties up. They will do whatever they can to control what is around that temple. Uh, so you think you're going to make some something happen to your house that's, uh, you know, you, as a homeowner? If the temple doesn't like it, they'll find a way because they don't want to have that uh, in their in their area. So they'll fight you uh, as much as, you know, these residents are fighting to not have this. 
the church will absolutely fight to protect that. As you said, they tried to close down a, a post office because they didn't want the post office as a neighbor um, next to the, the to that temple. Yeah, I don't know what they were trying to do. It's some kind of workaround. I don't know if they were trying to close it down, but I will say that in that area in Provo, they did buy out some um some motels that had been servicing homeless population. You know, there were there were some hotels there and they had definitely cleared the area to make it more acceptable to their purposes there. So yeah, yeah it's it's very true. Once the temple is built, they will fight to keep it, keep it the way that they like it. So interesting. All right. So now we're going to go on to an interesting example that we found that somebody sent us. The Tucson Temple. Let's, why don't you start reading about this? Because I thought this was fascinating. Okay. In February 2013, a church project manager submitted preliminary plans to Pima County to propose making church-owned property in the Catalina foothills where East Inner Road curves into Skyline Drive, the site for the Tucson, Arizona Temple. The seven-acre site was purchased by the church in 2010, and a residence to the north was subsequently acquired. The documents included surveys and environmental studies, plus site and floor plans that used a rendering of a two-story, 34,000-square-foot mission-style building to represent the Tucson, Arizona Temple. Plans proposed a 260-space parking lot with large areas of natural desert open space to provide a buffer for the surrounding neighborhood. <laughs> no rezoning was required for the site, as it was already zoned to allow religious buildings. The Tucson, Arizona Temple was originally designed with a 95-foot steeple, which would have required a special permit. However, plans were altered and the steeple was replaced with a dome, reminiscent of the famous dome that crowns Italy's Florence Cathedral, that did comply with Pima County's planning and zoning regulations. Now, that's amazing. Yeah, they actually took and accepted the zoning laws and <laughs> complied with them to avoid having to, to have a fight with the neighbors over this high uh, uh, steeple. And keep in mind that 95 foot is low compared to Bakersville. Yeah. Bakersfield, uh, <laughs> it's 15 McKinney, feet shorter Lone than Cody. Mountain. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lone Mountain, it's, uh, you know, 70, 80 feet uh, lower than the nose and uh, it's 105 feet lower than uh, what they're putting in Heber. So yeah, yeah. And also look at this, it's 2013. So this is Monson era. So when I say Hinckley era, I'm just kind of talking about a general, I think time period, I think Hinckley and Monson, I mean, look at this, they revise their plan to not have to go through that process that all these other five cities right now are going through. Something's changed. Um, another article about the same topic, because I wanted to find out more, because this seems like, is it an anomaly? Is it representational of how the era was? Um, this says, Steeple won't crown Mormon temple in the foothills. And it says, a seven-acre site in the Catalina foothills will soon be home to Southern Arizona's first Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint Temple. The church submitted plans to the Pima County for two-story 34,000 square foot temple in 2013 and the groundbreaking ceremony invitation only is on October 17th. The mission style design compiles complies with Pima County's zoning code, which allows for a church building to be 44 feet high and not including a cupola um, said the city, assist, uh, the planning official, the building and platform from the dome will measure at roughly 43 feet in height and the couple are adding about 27 feet plus the statue. And that would be, of course, Angel Moroni, right? The statue. The land was already zoned for the religious building, but early plans, including a 95 foot steeple, would have required the church to apply to the boards of adjustment for a variance, which is exactly what every temple we're following now has had to do because they're not going to do what the town already has said. Okay, this is what we'll accept. They've had to apply for a variance. What we did early on is advise the church to work with neighbors, even though if they're able to design to our regulations, they don't need to. Porter said, insisting on a spire, spire would have required a public hearing, he added. So that's very different. And that's just 10 years ago. Yeah. And in the Morador where there's, uh, you, you mm -hmm. know, a high percentage Mormons. So here you go. 
you know, the church has been advised, why be neighborly, work with the, within the zoning codes, consider even if your design meets the regulations, you should still talk to the neighbors and ask them what they would like to see and what recommendations they have. At least listen to them and take some of their uh, ideas and considerations. Yep. And I feel like that was just built. I don't think it ever had to go to a public hearing or anything like that. That That's correct. If you, if you meet the uh, requirements, you do not have to do that. Yep. And this is actually a picture of what they had first proposed. Remember that 95 foot steeple? And that, to me, that just looks kind of ridiculous. Doesn't that look ridiculous? To yeah, you it's, right there? <laughs> it looks like they've stuck it onto a Walmart building. Yep. Uh, yep. 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 So the redesign is much more attractive. I think it fits in much better. And it sounds like they very quickly after they submitted this said, oh, all right, fine. You know, and again, and you, that doesn't happen today. And you can also see it's not necessarily surrounded by just residences. You right. can see some other, you know, larger buildings or if those are residences, they're similar in size uh, yeah. to the uh, to the temple. Yeah, it, it's it, not dwarfing the area as we've seen some of these other temples. So mm -hmm. I think our next picture, yeah, there it is. So you can kind of compare the two. That's what ended up being built instead of that 95 foot tower. So I just thought that was an interesting exercise just to read how they took in consideration the town's existing zoning codes and regulations. They wanted to work with neighbors. Um, someone there in the process advised the church we should probably just do this. So we should probably make sure we listen to people. They were able to revise it quickly and have it built. It sounds like with no issue whatsoever. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Again, if you, if you meet all the codes, you don't have to go to a planning here and you yeah. don't need a conditional use permit. They issue, uh, they issue it without any hearing yeah. and, and you're allowed to build. You can start building right away without any lawsuits, right? So having read about the last, you know, 20 years in temple building, we had to ask ourselves, what has changed? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think we see in the picture here, uh, looking very savior-like. Yeah, that's that pose. <laughs> you know, it's interesting about this is that um, this was the dedication of, oh gosh, what are, oh, the Washington, oh, D.C. temple. Oh, Washington? No, Washington, D.C., I think. Yeah. Okay. And this was in the church news. And then everybody said, oh, uh, look at that pose. That's an awful lot like our logo for the LDS church. And they quickly took this picture away. Of course, everybody saves things. We all do. So here it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is what has changed is the man who's in charge has changed uh, since that time. And under new leadership, evidently came a completely new way of thinking about temples. Mm-hmm. A new vision, I would say. Absolutely. So but not, we kind of, what? Yeah, not just temples. He changed yeah. everything, it seems yeah. like. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The, the changes are making your head spin, honestly. It seemed like every day there was something new. Members, of course, are celebrating all these changes, while maybe some of them are going, wow, that's a lot of change really fast. I think older LDS, especially like my parents, they were like, wait, what? And we'll get into the different changes later. But for example, here's one of the biggest ones, and everybody pretty agree, much agrees. This is the one that impacts people daily, honestly. It impacts me because I still call myself a Mormon, and I'm constantly corrected <laughs> that I'm saying the wrong thing. So do you want to read this, uh, Landon? This is from the Salt Lake AP, just talking about one of the first huge changes that President Nelson, our new prophet in 2018, um, made. Yeah, the president of the Mormon Church reiterated Sunday that he wants members, the media, and others to use the face full name, saying nicknames are a major victory for Satan. Addressing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints twice yearly conference in Salt Lake City, Russell M. Nelson said the church's name is not negotiable. When the Savior clearly states that what the name of his church should be and even precedes his declaration with, thus shall my church be called, he is serious, Nelson said, and if we allow nicknames to be used and adopt or even sponsor those nicknames ourselves, he is offended. Nelson, 94, who is considered a prophet, reiterated that his instruction is not a name change, the Salt Lake Tribune reported. It is a correction, he said. It is the command of the Lord. Whew. 
whew, there you go. And that was picked up in the AP. Yep, that was one of the first major changes that we all heard about. Um, and then I think we sort of thought, wow, there's probably more coming. <laughs> do do you we remember when wrong. this happened? Do you remember when this happened? I oh. was going, yeah. what in the world I, are you talking about? There is no way I'm going to yeah. call myself uh, yeah. that. A or member of the this. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day yeah. Saints. No, I thought it was the worst PR move I'd ever heard of in my entire life. And I thought, because we're old enough to have gone through the I'm a Mormon campaign, the Meet the Mormons, the more good is what Mormon means. President Benson singing, I'm a Mormon boy. <laughs> I mean, all of us, you know, just realized that Mormon, you can't buy that kind of good PR. The word Mormon had a positive connotation on the global scale. I mean, you might think, oh, it's that church. I'm not sure, but I think they do service. Or I think, you know, you can't buy that kind of PR. And I kept thinking that anybody who was a member of the church that knew anything about SEO or, or PR was like going, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, I mean, you think about it, the Mormon missionaries, everyone knows who the Mormon missionaries yep. are. Um, you know, the, the other thing that they had to change all of the websites. Yep. All of the names for the websites That's had to be fire. redone. People had to be able to find, yeah, to yep. find them. They renamed the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, oh, the gosh. Signature Choir. You yep. Even Mormons can't tell you now what the name right. of the choir is. What, what is, is it? Now. I don't know. It's, it's the, the choir it's and choir orchestra at Temple Square, Square or something Temple. like that. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. it's gone. That's what I mean. Just the worst Their most PR. famous worldwide yep. known. Yep. And now nobody even knows the name of that choir anymore. Yep. That's exactly yeah. right. No, everything they had to change. And what was really funny to me is that, you know, the mainstream Brighamite LDS church is only a, a fraction, the biggest fraction of Mormonism. So a lot of the other branches said, I'm a Mormon. I'll take that word. So it's funny when you Google Mormon, and I know it was for SEO you can come across a lot of other stuff from the restoration or post-Mormon stuff. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. And the, the, the thing that was really sad is evidently President Nelson doesn't know his own uh, church very well because the original name of the church was not the Church of Jesus exactly. Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yep. It was the Church of Christ. <laughs> yeah, it was the Church of Christ. And I will say I've seen that used a lot now. Uh, they're yep. on their hum humanitarian Facebook page. They call themselves the Church of Christ. There's already a Church of Christ. The Bickertonites have been the Church of Christ since, I believe, 1867. They have the website, thechurchofchrist.org. The mainstream branch has had to take Church of Jesus Christ.org. So I feel like a lot of people will accidentally go over to the Bicker Tonight's, which is probably just fine. So yeah, the whole name thing was so convoluted and confusing. But again, it's just sort of this whole new out with the old. And does that include the vision of temple building of Hinckley? Out with the old and in with all of this new. Well, this very thought, this very, this was one of President Nelson's big issues that he had he this this was in his cross since uh for yep. years and years and years before he became uh the prophet and it was his little thing that he just couldn't wait to change and we'll talk about that and see yeah. how bad that was uh and and this is really i think what turned him and and president hinckley at odds yeah, I think so too. I think we didn't realize there was sort of a prophetic feud, if you can say that. But as soon as this name change, which was so extreme, took place, we started hearing the rumblings of, well, you know, he's always wanted to do this. And then there was an incident. So let's go to our next slide to look at this. Okay. So this happened back in uh, 1990. And here is young President Nelson giving a conference talk. And it says, then Apostle Russell Nelson, he was an apostle, made an attempt at implementing a name change in 1990. So you're right when you say stuck in his craw. This is 1990. He gave a talk during general conference called, Thus Shall My Church Be Called. I read the whole talk, and that's exactly what he says. He talks about this is what the Lord wants it to be called. We shouldn't use any counterfeit name. You know, this is what we should be calling ourselves. Nothing else, no nickname. What happened at the next conference, Landon? Do you want to read that next paragraph? Yeah, the very next <laughs> conference, President Hinckley completely contradicted Nelson's talk in the previous conference with the talk 
Mormon should mean more good, even calling out Nelson's talk specifically. This was viewed generally as a public correcting by the prophet. And you yeah, can see that... that President Nelson did not take that well. He had to obey it, but he held that from 1990 until he was able to change it. I can't remember what the year was when he when he finally changed that. Yeah, but... I think it was six years ago. So, but a prophet's grudge. And if we go to the next slide, I think we have some more specifics on it. But yeah, a lot of people don't know this. So yeah, why don't you read this, uh, Landon? This is great. Many this of our is... people... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this, is this is from is... his talk. Yep. From President Hinckley, who was Hinckley's the prophet talk. at the time. This is his correction of what President Nelson had said six months prior. He said, many of our people are disturbed by the practice of the media and of many others to disregard totally the true name of the church and to use the nickname the Mormon Church. Six months ago in our conference, Elder Russell M. Nelson delivered an excellent address on the correct name of the church. He quoted the words of the Lord himself, thus shall my church be called in the last days, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He then went on to discourse on the various elements of that name. I commend to you a reading of his talk. And so, while I sometimes regret that people do not call this church by its proper name, I am happy that the nickname they use is one of great honor made so by a remarkable man and a book which gives an unmatched testimony concerning the Redeemer of the world. Mormon means more good. This is the, these are the words of President Hinckley, publicly correcting President mm -hmm. Nelson, for attempting to tell members that if they use the word Mormon, it was a victory for Satan. Uh, and he corrected him in public, in general conference. He would have been a younger uh, a, a younger apostle without a lot of a, uh, seniority at the time, 34 years ago. Um, and he was corrected by President Hinckley. And since that time, I think he could not wait uh, to, to correct what he had been publicly called out, uh, which is that repentance? You're told by a prophet that you need to fix something and you say, oh, and then 34 years later say, ah, now yeah. I get to uh -huh. do what I just <laughs> repented from, you know? That's right. Well, and it's interesting to see that uh, President Hinckley did say, go and read his talk. I mean, you know, it was, it was very <laughs> subtle the way he was saying it, but I don't think I've ever seen any prophet ever refer to what somebody else said and then say something different. And President Hinckley also brought up that it was the prophet Joseph Smith himself who said that Mormon means more good. So he's saying that kind of overrides this other idea that you had, uh, Elder Nelson. And keep in mind that President Hinckley and the church at, at this time were spending millions of dollars on a Meet the Mormon campaign, introducing yep. everyone. And the first word of every person's thing is, I'm so-and-so, and I'm a Mormon. I'm a Mormon, <laughs> yeah. And there were movies in or documentaries in theaters, Meet the Mormons, where people would go. Which which should have been a big red flag to so many members uh, when they start, when he comes in and tells them, you can't use this anymore, after we just spent a decade promoting everyone calling us Mormons and appreciating us as Mormons, not as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But he comes in and immediately goes back to his talk from 34 years earlier and implements. Yep, that's exactly right. Been waiting for this day for a long time. So let's find out a little bit more about kind of the way that Russell Nelson is going to approach being the prophet, receiving revelation, and making so many changes that all of our heads are spinning. And of course, this is all also through the lens of temple building which is a part of all of this because it's done so differently than it's been done in the past. All right. You want, this is from CNN and this is Wendy Nelson, his wife talking about, is it, this, is this her quote? Yes, it yep. is. This is, this is Wendy telling CNN how it works. She says, when the messages come during the dark of night, Russell M. Nelson reaches for his lighted pen and takes dictation from the Lord. Okay, dear, it's happening, the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints tells his wife, Wendy Nelson. I just remain quiet, and soon he's sitting up at the side of the bed writing, she said in a recent church video. Sometimes the spirit prompts the prophet's wife to leave the bed, though she'd rather sleep. 
One such morning, Wendy Nelson told Mormon leaders her husband emerged from the bedroom waving a yellow notebook. Wendy, you won't believe what's been happening for two hours, she recalled Russell Nelson saying. The Lord has given me detailed instructions on a process I am to follow. Nelson's nighttime messages have increased exponentially, his wife said, since last year when the 94-year-old took the helm of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, widely known as the Mormon Church. One of the things the Spirit has repeatedly impressed upon my mind since my new calling as president of the church, Nelson said, is how willing the Lord is to reveal his mind and will. Yeah, I see you're a little cringeworthy there. It's like as soon actually, as I got as soon as I got in charge, the Lord's really opened up. <laughs> actually terrifying in a way. I think of the fact that he is in control of more money in the stock market globally than small countries. What if the Lord has him write on his notebook, note to self, take money out, right? Yeah, it could, it could crash the global the entire... economy. <laughs> yeah, that's an extreme example. But I'm telling you, coming out of his room, waving a notebook, saying, I now know what I need to do and making all these changes. I don't know. I don't know if all of you realize this is how it works, but apparently this is how it works. And and you can see that he evidently comes up with ideas and starts writing them down, and he fully believes that the Lord is the one who's telling him these things, yep. uh, which kind of shows you his mindset that mm -hmm. uh, his thoughts are the Lord's thoughts now that he's been put into this yep. position. Yep, which uh, is why she said now, you know, how willing the Lord is to reveal his mind and will, because every thought he has is now the Lord's mind. And, yep. Yes, and he is in a position where he can implement any thought he has. Yes, this this is really quite revealing <laughs> about how how re revelation works in the church. You become the president, and now your thoughts are the Lord's thoughts, and anything you write down now comes directly from him. Sorry, I was taking a drink. I was kind of <laughs> rattled by that. So uh, Wendy also said, I have seen- This is in the same, same yeah. CNN report. Um, I have seen him changing the last 10 months. It's as though he has been unleashed, said Nelson in an interview provided by the church's news operation and posted on mormonnewsroom.org. Actually, I think this is from a, a, a Mormon newsroom, another article. I think this yeah, is not the same. Yeah, but they're quoting it. Uh, yeah, the exactly. CNN is quoting it. Yeah. He's, he's free to follow through with things he's been concerned about but could never do. What things could those be? Maybe now that change he's president, the name of the church. <laughs> now that he's president, he can do those things, she added. He sees things and says, what are we doing that for? What are we spending the widow's might on that for? For example, what are we spending the widow's might on lawyers to sue small towns to put in giant temples? Why are we spending the widow's might on that? That was my thought when I read that phrase. Uh, my thought was they're not spending the widow's might; they're investing the widow's might, yes. not uh, not spending it on anything. But that that paragraph up there really is quite scary and should be concerning to anybody who uh, is a member of the church, where it says he's free to follow through with things he's been concerned about, but could never do. In other words, I, I thought this was the Lord that was right leading the church, but no. It appears now that it's President Nelson who's making the decisions, because we were told that all these prophets before were receiving revelation, but it appears he did not believe they were receiving revelation because they weren't doing it the way that he would do it. Now that he's president, he can do those things. All of a sudden, Jesus's revelations completely turn around. The Lord is now telling this prophet something different than he told the previous prophets, and we're to believe that that's the will of the Lord and not the mind of President Nelson. Hmm. Well, I think we're going to fix that in a conference talk as we go forward, because I think people did have that thought. Well, wait a minute. What about what President Hinckley said or President Monson said something different? So um, let's just talk about a few of the things that he did change. And of course, I had to put up David Bowie ch -ch -ch changes uh, <laughs> on there. So since taking office in 2018, Nelson has instituted a number of changes, including cutting an hour from Sunday meetings, modifying home ministry programs, consolidating levels of church leadership, eliminating historical pageants, announcing a new edition of Mormon hymns, 
revising guidelines for bishops who counsel young adults, allowing missionaries to contact their family more often, and ending the church's 100-year association with the Boy Scout. Woo, your head is spinning. And, you know, some of those I might look at as, oh, that's great. Others might say, ah, oh, that's not great. So there's just a lot of change. I grew up in the church and I spent 50, uh, about 50 years uh, all in. I did the mission. I did all of these things. I was in bishoprics. I, I left the church about seven years ago. And I do not recognize yeah. the church that I was in for 50 years, which hardly ever changed in the 50 right. years I was in. In the last six years, there have been more changes than the previous 50 years of my life. Uh, I think the only thing that really changed of any significance in my lifetime up to that point was the priest lifting of the priesthood ban. Yep. Other than that, I can't think of anything that really was a significant change in the church. Uh, oh, they did go to the three-hour block. Uh, I, we used to go in yeah. the morning, and then we'd go yeah. back in the afternoon. Gas that crisis was, of 1970. That was when I was very young that that changed. Yeah. yeah. So other than that, that's like two changes in 50 years that I yeah. can think of. Nelson comes in, and it's like he seemed to have had a problem with everything in the church <laughs> because he changed all of it. <laughs> it's like... It was as if he sat there going, this church is being run completely wrong. Wait until I'm in charge. <laughs> and then he steps in in charge and he changes everything. So, yeah. But I'm not disagreeing with everything here. I mean, although I thought it was funny how you said, what do you mean now it's two hours? Are you freaking kidding me? I've left and now it's only two hours. He, he ruined my faith transition. It's like, well, at least I'm out of three hour church. Nope, you're only out of two hour church. And then COVID right. happened and I was I'm not out of anything. Nope. Everyone was out of church. <laughs> nope, it's a whole new day. That's true. And it's a whole new day as far as temple building. Okay, let's go to our next slide. And I think this is, yeah, this is what we're talking about. So so it is a problem because people go, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, even just that meet the Mormons idea. Just a few years ago, our prophets were, you know, telling us meet the Mormon. I am a Mormon here. And now somebody's saying that's a victory. So extreme a victory for Satan. How are we supposed to reconcile this in our mind? What a prophet said when I was a kid and what a prophet's saying now. How can I keep track? What's going on? Well, this was solved by Elder Alan D. Haney in a talk in General Conference called A Living Prophet for the Latter Days, where he uttered these very famous words. You want to read these words, Landon? He said, brothers and sisters, unlike vintage comic books and classic cars, Prophetic teachings do not become more valuable with age. That is why we should not seek to use the words of past prophets to dismiss the teachings of living prophets. And there it is. There it's it like is. like a get out of jail free card. Hey, uh, we should always listen to the whatever he says. It doesn't matter if it conflicts with what the previous prophet said. We should always listen to the living prophet. I think a lot of us say, well, if they're all listening to the Lord, why would it change at all? Because it should all be the voice of the Lord, not the voice of a dead prophet or a living prophet. You're thinking too much when you say that. That's Those are the mysteries. You don't delve into those, <laughs> those at all. Are, those are and the I mysteries know, that led me out of the church. <laughs> that's right, the mysteries. And I don't know if everybody realizes, but in that same talk by Elder Haney is when he gave the crushed water bottle uh, metaphor scenario where he talked about walking into the cafeteria and some of the upper leadership were sitting with Nelson. And when he finished eating, he crushed his water bottle and everyone looked around that, well, he did it. I better do it. Right. And then they all crushed their water, you know, so very different from, I think how president Nelson might've looked at president Hinckley, right? These other leaders looked at president Nelson and said, I'm crushing it right there. Just like him. I don't want to take the risk that I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and and it was so he, he made the the you know, basically said, if the prophet crushes a water bottle, you should do it because yep. he did it. You know, yep. no Good thought, no, me. you know, <laughs> the fact that he did it, you should do it. Uh this was this this is a talk that will live in infamy. This I think was so too. <laughs> yep, the, the crushed water bottle memes, we can't even begin. When I was searching for a picture of a crushed water bottle, oh my gosh, so many memes, so many talented people out there. It was pretty telling. So, all right, let's go to our next slide. So this idea of being a leader who erases the past, meaning erases the words or the work of another leader, this is absolutely not anything new. And you came across this and learned more about this on your trip to Egypt a couple of years ago. 
Yeah, yeah, we took a trip to Egypt and fascinating, loved it, one of the great experiences of my life. Um, but one of the things that we uh, discovered is that as we were touring Egypt, we'd come across uh, these tombs or whatever, and there were images that had been clearly just picked out and, and basically the equivalent of erased because they didn't have an eraser. They would just chip it out and make <laughs> this, this person disappear. Um, and so it became a question, what, what's going on here? And we were told, oh, this the new pharaoh didn't like the old pharaoh, so they would go and chip out the pieces so that that person, they would go to every place that that pharaoh was depicted, and they chipped it away to make that pharaoh just disappear. It was an attempt to erase them from history. Um, this says there could be several reasons why a pharaoh might undertake such actions. Pharaohs might have sought to erase the memory of a predecessor who was unpopular. Akhenaten, seen as a threat to their own legitimacy or had a co controversial reign. This erasure aimed to eliminate any positive legacy associated with the previous ruler. Ramses II just stamped everything in sight. Well, why not? Erasing the memory of certain events or individuals could be a means for a ruler to consolidate their power by controlling the narrative of history. By manipulating historical records, they could shape public perception and reinforce their authority. Other rulers may do this, ju not just pharaohs. In certain cases, a pharaoh might seek to punish individuals or families by erasing their names or legacies from historical records as a form of retribution. Like Hatshepsut, I'm, I'm sure I killed that, and Thutmose III, a notable example of eraser and alteration of historical records, Hatshepsut was one of the new female pharaohs of ancient Egypt who ruled during the 18th dynasty. She took the throne after the death of her husband, Thutmose II, and acted as regent for her stepson, Thutmose III, who was initially too young to rule. Hatshepsut eventually assumed the full powers of pharaoh, and during her reign, Egypt experienced peace, prosperity, and significant architectural accomplishments, such as the construction of the famous mortuary temple, at Deir el Bahari. However, after her death, Thutmose III took measure to erase or deface many of her monuments, inscriptions, and statues. Hmm. So I couldn't help after knowing this from Egypt, but to think, is this what President uh, uh, Nelson is trying to do to President Hinckley's uh, past? He's trying to erase it by getting rid of his small temple uh, revelation by changing the name of the church that he was, you know, so against. Uh, it, it almost seems as if he's trying to erase the history of President Hinckley in retribution for being rebuked back <laughs> in 1990 when he was an apostle. I don't know. Stranger things have happened. I mean, it does seem to be a weird change of a, of a chain of events, I think. Yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, I, I don't know how you can't think of that and see that many changes and say something. President Nelson certainly did not like the way the church was being run up until he was appointed. Right. I we think we also have true. to think uh, he got rid of uh, President Uchtdorf, oh, that's who was true. a well-beloved apostle, yeah. one of the favorite members of the first presidency. Uh Hardly ever happened. Uh, the last time it happened, it was, uh, what was it? Hubie Brown who got Over the removed, priesthood ban. Over the priesthood ban yeah, because he supported he, allowing the yeah. uh, the blacks to have the priesthood. He was removed by the incoming uh, president of the church. Yeah, it's always political. It's always yep. a political reason. They say it's not, oh, I'm leaving for family issues, right? <laughs> to spend more time with family down in the lower ranks of the apostles. It's always political. So, yeah. So this just got us to think, because when we deal with these uh, back to temple building, when we deal with these cities, they're like, why? Why is this happening? Why won't they compromise? Why these giant temples? Why not something that we could approve right now that will fit into our footprint where everybody, you know, can participate and it's a blessing to the community. And and again, this is there are some smaller temples being built now, but even the smaller ones seem to have the massive 
spires and we're just we're just trying to figure this out so this picture kind of represents here's the one of them on the left is the linden temple by my house oh my gosh that is gigantic there's the mckinney lone mountain there's i put uh the um Leighton temple and the syracuse temple for you also massive mm -hmm. so yeah there just seems to be an increase and a decrease in that vision of the small temple building yeah and again not only is he, it, it almost appears that uh, President Nelson is, one, President Hinckley had announced quite a few temples, and it seems as if President Hinckley's going, I'm going to triple, quadruple the number. He's announced temples in places where they, they, they're never even going to be, you know, he, he announced uh, China, <laughs> uh, t places where the temples have been announced years ago and still right. have no even even idea where the land would come from or even be allowed. It's like he just needs to be the prophet that announced the most temples of any prophet. And then they've got to be bigger than Hinckley's temples. Yeah. And this just seems to be a race to the bottom <laughs> right here of, of pride, which is amazing because we grew up in the Benson era where right. pride is you know the cycle of pride in the book of mormon and it right. appears that this is the ultimate peak of the pride cycle right here where we have a proud <laughs> We're on <an> upward <laughs> it's a, a pride comes before the fall if we remember yep. and i i think that uh, we may very well see uh, and we've started to see a fall and a decline in uh, church membership and church activity under president nelson uh so, because of the there's nothing that you can hold on to. There's nothing that links generations together. They yes. think the temple is going to link generations together. A shared values, a shared um, ritual system is yeah. what binds families together. And when you completely change all of the rituals and all of the things that everyone had been doing for 50 years, you've lost it. Yeah, and it's true. We should mention the the temple ceremony itself has undergone major changes, which I don't disagree with those either. But it is interesting, and I wonder if in the back of people's minds is, well, President Nelson will probably pass away eventually, and then are those words just in the dust? And it's, you know, you're just, you're like a goldfish who has a three-second attention span. You forget, you forget. You're, yeah, there's the, no the continuity. Next... The next, yeah, when there's no continuity, what's the purpose of a religion that provides no continuity? Yep, that's it. All right, let's go to our next slide. Okay, so this kind of brings us to, this is a wonderful picture from the Daily Mail, our friend Miles, the, the reporter who did that awesome article today. And it kind of shows the five temples that we're covering because people are saying, why is this happening now, all of a sudden? Why now in these five places? Well, we're finding out from different things we're digging into that it did happen in the past. It just wasn't as easy to catch and to see pre-internet, but there has been, you know, there have been some things happening, but right now, all because of height and size and having to request a variance in a residential area, these are the five towns, Bakersfield, Cody, Heber Valley, Fairview, and Lone Mountain, where this has been happening. Yep. And not only that, suddenly in the last two weeks, articles actually detailing what's happening. We haven't ever really seen this before, have we, Landon? We've seen one-offs, local, you know, Cody will cover Cody or Lone Mountain will cover Lone Mountain. But all of a sudden, reporters are starting to look at the big picture, like we've always been trying to say, somebody look at the big picture. <laughs> Yeah, the Salt Lake Tribune came out with this article uh, that covers Nevada, Wyoming, Texas. It says small towns uh, have become neighborhood battlegrounds as feuds break out about the building height and light. Uh, and and I, I, I got to say, you know, that if we take this back a step, I can't think of anything that made people argue as much as when Nelson changed that we would be called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yep, all of a sudden, people who you'd used to go up to and just say, oh, you Mormons, and all of a sudden, people just yeah. snap and go, yeah. we're the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of yeah. Latter-day Saints. That's an offense to us. Use the right terms. And all of a sudden, what is friendly, neighborly, what what everyone was taught to call you Mormons because they'd done a millions of dollar campaign to get everyone to call you Mormon. Now they're all offended and trying to get you not to call them Mormon. And so 
that started with Nelson right off the bat. And now he's gone in with the temples and the neighborhoods and they've become battlegrounds as they, as he has insisted that these temples go into residential areas, not zoned for them. And he's completely left behind the smaller temples, working with the communities, changing designs to fit the community. It's my way or the highway, just like it was with what you call yourself as, as a Mormon. Yep, I think so too. And that that causes instant, like you're uncomfortable. You don't know what you said wrong. You, I mean, I think about our resident in Heber who was trying to go approach the city council on dark skies. And we do have a short of this on our YouTube channel for Mormonish podcast. And she goes up to the city council, who's all LDS in Heber Valley. And she says, I know that there's been discord. I know that people think we're anti-Mormon. We're not. You know, I want to have good relations with you guys. I want to read you this quote. And she kind of unrolls a piece of paper. She goes, I want to read you this quote. From President Nelson, the Church of the Latter Day, this was in the last conference, and he says, and then she goes through that quote where he says, we need to be peacemakers, we need to get along, we need to understand each other, I implore you, you know, get to know each other, don't focus on differences, this is actually a really great quote, and she finishes it, and, you know, she stops reading, and the guy at the council table goes, it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day, that's all he has to say, and she's like, <laughs> I'm very sorry, sir. This is what was written on my paper. I apologize. I mean, the conversation is shut down. It's over. You know, it's just so off-putting. It, it's absolutely off-putting. It reminds me of the Princess Bride. Remember when the guy who always goes, my name is Diego Montoya. And he just <laughs> prepared goes on. Prepared to and die. On. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Prepared to die. And it's, it's like, it's so long. No one ever gets it right. And to think that people to expect people to get something right, we 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 laugh because we find it misstated so many times yeah. because nobody can remember no can anything that long. <laughs> no, and we watch a lot of news conferences and a lot of city meetings where they're trying to say it correctly and nobody can. I'd like to actually grab those sound bites. The Church of the Latter, the Saint, the Church of Christ, the the more. They can't. No one can yep. just, it does not roll off the tongue. And then there's that thing where they say, tell me that you're Mormon without saying the word Mormon. Oh, we belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter -day Saints. Oh, is that uh, one of those Christian churches? No, no, we're different. We we have a restoration. Oh, are you the, no, the, oh, all right, fine. We're Mormons. Oh, you're Mormons. Great. Oh, I mean, we have the Book so of Mormon. <laughs> yes. Uh <laughs> You know, and it's funny because Hinckley's talk, I didn't put this in here, where he chastised Nelson, he went on and on about a wonderful person, what a wonderful person Mormon was, and that we should be proud to have that nickname because of everything Mormon did and everything, you know, that, that he sacrificed for the people today. So that was his whole idea. It's a wonderful nickname because it represents a wonderful person in his mind, in the scriptures. So anyway, it's interesting. Um, so this was the Salt Lake Tribune article. Then we have an Axios article that came out. This is all within the last two weeks. Zoning disputes, lawsuits, and tension surround new Mormon temple plans. Again, they're talking about all five cities. I just can't imagine this is the kind of PR the church wants. And it's avoidable. <laughs> Hinkley would roll over in his grave. He would. He would roll over in his grave. He absolutely would. And then the article that we're talking about today, we've known this was coming out. We've been talking with the reporter and putting him in touch with different people in the cities. This is the Daily Mail. His headline is, Inside the Bitter Fight Between the Mormons and Small Town America, a church accused of bullying picturesque hamlets into letting them build towering temples. It is very sensational. He says, Communities say building spree of mega temples will ruin their peaceful idols. Um, church opponents have been labeled bigots and threatened with legal action and residents say campaign of intimidation has torn neighborhoods apart. Again, what do you think President Hinckley would think if he were seeing multiple headlines in a national arena saying this? And I think it's funny that the Daily Mail starts with inside the bitter fight between the Mormons. <laughs> they haven't gotten the message yet. The style guide is not. It's funny how the style guide says, that's the guy that tells reporters how to refer to the church. You can say, you know, the name of the church. And then afterwards you can say the church. I love it. How people say the church, what church? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know how many churches there are? <laughs> Especially in areas where the church is not at all prominent to just exactly. call it the church. Yeah. Well, do you know how many churches of Jesus Christ there are? Yeah. 
Randy Bell shared a list with me. It's off the charts. There are a lot. Absolutely. Yep. And let's see. Okay. So we're going to talk about also thinking of President Hinckley, this kind of PR. Um, this is from a meeting, the initial meeting with the residents of Fairview about the McKinney Temple. And not only is the Hinckley era over as far as working with neighborhoods, trying to be accommodating, taking pride in working with neighborhoods. It's a totally different tactic now. It's I'm going to sue your you know what. So here's the very first meeting. It's a little hard to hear, but you can read the subtitles. What they said to the residents. <laughs> So that's the very first meeting with the residents. They get a flyer. Hey, come talk about this two-story building that meets all the regulations. Not true there. And then they show up at the church building and the lawyer says, um, the DOJ is probably going to sue you if you don't comply. And you got to you gotta keep in line. And it's funny. Did you hear the residents' reaction? Yeah, they, they were going, he's lying. <laughs> yeah, and they were like, what? You could hear someone go, wow, exactly, wow. In a very short span, we've gone from working with neighborhoods, taking pride and fitting into the neighborhood, working with residents to first meeting, we're going to sue you. Or the DOJ you, is going to sue yeah, you. Yeah, DOJ is going to sue you yeah. and you have no choice but to allow us in here. Yeah. Uh, so don't even try to fight us. Is you yeah. know, and, and and this isn't a church leader. This is no. their lawyer. Their lawyer is yeah. who they have come in and talk to them about being neighborly. I mean, if if the first interaction you had with your new neighbor who moved in next door is he sends his lawyer over to tell you, yeah. hey, you know, uh, your your dog better not pee on the neighbor's lawn, <laughs> or we're gonna sue you. How well? How much do you want that neighbor moving in? You're going to do everything you can to make sure that neighbor doesn't come in. The neighbor himself sends his lawyer out to tell you how yep. it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And this is not just a one-off. And boy, these these Texas re residents right away were like, okay, you made it pretty clear pretty quick. We get it. And that lands us where we are now. Um, I think our next example of this kind of neighborly approach is yeah, this is the Lone Mountain um, City Council or the Planning Commission. Yeah. Planning Commission? Yeah, the Planning Commission. It's the Planning Commission. Yeah. yeah. And here's one of the members of the Planning Commission, and he already knows what's in store. And he's so concerned that he's just going to do whatever, kind of roll over and do whatever needs to be done. So here we go. <laughs> Would stick out, they've already talked about. Um, so I guess my thing is, is that, you know, looking at the whole picture, and this boils down to legality. The last thing the city needs is another lawsuit, millions of dollars. So we might have to make sure we do it right. So if you get offended by the final decision, know that there's another element to that. And I offer to you and, and the, other, uh, the other group. Yeah, the other element is the threat of lawsuit because they've seen this before. Yep, and the city of Las Vegas is currently under a, a a lawsuit that's cost them tens of millions of dollars. Right, and they're saying we don't we don't have the stomach for another fight with another big organization. So right. we're going to make the decision, uh, and you guys are just going to have to live with it because we we don't want yeah. to uh, uh, engage in another lawsuit. We can't afford it. Yep. So go ahead and build your temple because we just can't. There's nothing we can do. Yeah. Neighborly. And we've all and we've all made received pretty good contributions <laughs> from the lawyers <laughs> on the, the city other council. side to yes. uh, on the city help council. us make a decision as well. So between yep. those two things, uh, very 
very yep. low probability that yep. uh, that you're going to change any minds here. We'll watch it. That meeting's coming up in a month, a month from tomorrow, I think. So, all right. What else do we have in terms of being neighborly when the church wants to build a temple in your town? <laughs> Well, let's see if we stick out. Let's see. That was the one we just saw. One. And yeah. let's see. We Here go. we go. Okay. This is one that I put out this morning. And this happened last summer in Cody, Wyoming, when they were prepping and giving instructions to the planning and zoning board as far as what their responsibility was when they were thinking about voting. Should they vote for the temple or not? There was some confusion on the spire, on the footprint. And so the city planner is reminding the planning and zoning board what their duty is here. And we should mention that the city planner is LDS. Yes, we should. City of Cody, Wyoming staff report, page 13, released prior to the June 27, 2023 planning and zoning meeting about the proposed LDS temple. If you do not personally agree with the city attorneys or my interpretation that the Cody Wyoming Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints complies with the building height requirement of the Cody Zoning Ordinance, having an official height of approximately 25 to 26 feet from the finished grade to the highest point of the coping of the flat roof, please prepare to be directly questioned in court to explain your logic and conclusion and why it is any more sound than that presented by your staff, legal and planning. This is not intended to be threatening, but simply letting you know that strict scrutiny to which your personal decision will be subject. I would recommend that you have your logic and conclusions ready to present at the June 27, 2023 meeting so that it can be discussed by the board. Cody, Wyoming, City Planner, LDS. <laughs> That's terrifying. If you're just a regular P&Z board member and your city planner says, you're going to vote against it? You're going to be questioned in court. You better have every, all your ducks in a row as to why you voted against it. And he he gave the interpretation that it that uh, it that the steeple met the zoning codes, which mm -hmm. have a 35 foot uh, height, and the the spire is 110 feet tall. <laughs> Notice how he worded that too. Uh, an official height of approximately 25 to 26 feet from finished grade to the highest point of the coping of the flat roof. It's a 110 foot steeple. I have no yeah. idea what that 25 to 26 no. feet from finish grade to the highest point of the coping of the flat roof means. I, I think what he's trying to say is the steeple doesn't count. So right. we're only going to the highest point of the of the rooftop and everything above that uh, is irrelevant. And I'm telling yep. you that you the steeple isn't part of the building and therefore you have to pass it. And if you don't pass it, you better be ready to go into court and defend it as to why you made this decision. Yep, I'm sure that's true because we have somebody else, I think it's a, is it a lawyer or an area rep in in uh, Fairview with the McKinney Temple saying it is a 68 foot building with a 107 foot spire, but it's still just a two story building. So that's exactly what they say every time. The spire is invisible. You do not see it, it's not there. All right, what else do we have? We had so many examples to pull out just from these five places. So, okay, here we go. Um, this is also in Cody. LDS rep says further litigation will cost the city. What does this say, Landon? This is a newspaper article. The controversy over the proposed Cody Temple for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints became more polarized last week as LDS representatives said they would not consider another location besides Skyline Drive. It was a gut punch that they never considered it because that would fix all the dissent, said Carla Egelhoff, uh, a member of the Preserve Our Cody Neighborhoods. The location is the one thing that's not okay about this building. LDS representatives also said potential lit litigation would be costly for the city and its citizens who would likely lose in the courts and cited a federal law protecting religious rights. So again, no consideration to move, no consideration to lower the temple, no consideration to uh, lower the steeple height, uh, no consideration whatsoever. We're gonna, we've got more money than you. We'll take you to court. You'll lose. We'll win. Bottom line, just as Jesus would do. <laughs> and it's very <laughs> different from Tucson. I mean, you, we read those articles. Oh, yeah. we'll revisit this. We'll look at it. And this gave really bad headlines. Like I didn't pull all of them, but it was 
big church sues small town, threatens to sue small town into oblivion. I mean, there were some headlines there in Cody that were just, again, like you said, Hinkley era, they'd be going, no, no, we don't want this. Yeah. And you'd think that the public relations arm of the church would be going, stop this. You're, you're giving us a, a horrible reputation, but we know, uh, Doug Anderson was one of the ones at the Cody yeah. meeting. He's the uh, head of PR, basically the the head voice that we see since yeah. uh, Aaron uh, has not appeared anywhere. Uh, but Doug Anderson is the church's PR yeah. representative, and he's at these meetings, yeah, participating. Yeah, kind of saying this. So yeah, and this was again, this was a year ago. This is all kind of what was going down in Cody, but we're just kind of show this pattern. If we just can't believe the negative PR and it really doesn't have to be that way. If you take a page out of the playbook of the Hinckley era, where you're just like, okay, let's all work together. Let's figure this out. But for some reason, that's not on the table. Yeah, and regardless of whether it's um, PR or not, you just take a page out of the Bible or out of Jesus's teachings <laughs> or the book of Mormon <laughs> or the book of Mormon for that matter yeah. to see that this is not the way we are supposed to behave uh, with the people around us, uh, you know, well, and there's going to be disagreements on things, but you try to work through them. You try to accommodate, you try to be neighborly. And there is zero effort to do that in any of these communities. Yeah. Well, I would also point to that talk at last conference by elder Gerard about integrity and I podcasted with lovely Jane over on 21st Century Saints about this. And it is the idea of being neighborly and following Jesus Christ, loving your neighbor and following Jesus Christ. And this talk redefined it. You follow what the church wants. And that means you're following Jesus Christ. And sometimes that means you're at odds with being neighborly or loving your neighbor and what your neighbor wants. So this is a perfect example of this. These LDS residents in these towns, they don't want to do anything against their neighbors. They love their neighbors. They love their community. But the church is telling them that this is what God wants them to do. And so they're doing it. And there's a clip we've played over and over from a resident um, at a lone. No, it was a Fairview planning meeting Fairview. where she said, you know, because God has told the prophet to build the Lone Mountain Temple or to build the McKinney Temple like this, you are asking us to choose between being neighborly, loving your neighbor, as it says in the scriptures, and Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what I just said. By this new definition, integrity or whatever it would be, following Jesus means following the church at the expense of loving your neighbor. And that is simply not how it works in anyone's book. Well, it's completely contrary to what the scriptures say. Exactly. Um, you know, the, the first great commandment is to love God, and the second is to love your neighbor. And I think, as you've said, um, loving your neighbor is how you show that you mm -hmm. love God, uh, yep. not the other way around. Uh, loving God isn't how you show you love your neighbor. Yep. So, and especially when God represents a church that's making you do things that are really hurting your neighbors. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. It's in complete conflict with everything that the scriptures teach, and quite frankly, everything that we learned as uh, growing up in the church, yep. that's contrary. And that's, that's why this stinks to so many people. They're going, yep. this is not how we were taught to treat people. Why are we treating people this way? Yep. But again, they have to do with what the church says, like the steeple doctrine. They never knew anything about that. But as soon as we're trickled down that they need to care about the height of the spire for a legal workaround, they cared about the height of the spire. And they talked about it in every meeting. Yeah, President Nelson is putting the members in a very difficult spot yep. Uh, yep. and doesn't seem to care about that. Nope. And some members do stand up in the meetings and say, I just in good conscience can't do this. But again, I wish there was some recognition of this by leadership that it's very difficult on the ground for people that have to be in this every day. Um, another headline from Cody, fourth lawsuit filed in Cody Temple dispute. The church filed two. The residents had to file two in response. I mean, these headlines are just, they're not what you're used to seeing about the Mormon church. And we keep being told the, the temple will bless your community. Yeah. No. Anyone tell me how having lawsuits between the church and the city helps bless your community. And these are being funded by uh, 
you know, the, the citizens are having to, to come up with tens of thousands of dollars out of their pockets, maybe yeah. even hundreds of thousands of yes. dollars out of their pockets to fight this. And you're trying to tell them, oh, you'll be blessed as a result yeah. of, of having to spend $100,000 fighting uh, a church uh, that's trying to move a, a temple. And you can see, here's Cody, you know, you can yes. see that the uh, that this big white uh, Spanish colonial looking yeah. thing uh, just it really doesn't fit in. Uh, it's up on a hill a little bit away from the downtown, but this is the flavor of the entire town. It's a very Western, very uh, uh, country look to it. And, and uh, that makes quite a difference. So Well, it's interesting. It is on a hill. And I feel like if it's built after all this unpleasantness, and the divisiveness and the neighbors just, you know, it's just so difficult there. We've been there. We visited. We've seen this firsthand. That temple on a hill, when people look up and see that, what do you think their feelings will be? Well, on either side, they'll recognize that they've lost their community for that glowing building on the hill. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Oh, and here's another one. A judge says that the church can now join the lawsuit against the Heber Valley Temple as its own defendant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a case where uh, the church is now joining the city in defending against a lawsuit brought by the citizens. Right. So they're basically footing the bill to try to get their uh, to try to get this passed uh, through. Yep. And again, unlimited funds are being spent by the church, and you know the citizens group. I think this the one that's left. I think is an individual funding it completely. So. Yeah, I think it's a group, a citizens group. Yeah, that's doing it. But it's funny because Heber and Cody are the ones that are farther along in the process, and all their headlines are lawsuit, lawsuit, lawsuit. The other ones a little newer in the process, still going through planning commissions. And and in that case, you just see headlines about you know residents, you know members intimidating and going to meeting. You know, it's just it's textbook. You can follow along the procedures. Eventually, those towns will end up in the headlines: lawsuit, 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 lawsuit. It's inevitable. Yeah. yeah. Yep, it's true. So this was the little Easter egg I told you about. So in the Daily Mail article, as I said, we had been interviewed. Nemo had given them tons of information, had talked about his visit, 4,000 miles of travel to get to, to McKinney and to talk to, at the Fairview County meeting or the Fairview City meeting. And they talked to many different residents. But guess who got quoted in the article? Landon, do you want to read your own quote? <laughs> I, I don't know that I want to, but uh, it said, uh, you said it yeah, once. I, Say it again. <laughs> I did talk to the reporter. He'd asked me, you know, several questions. He was asking, you know, why do you think he 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 kind of came down? He said, why do you think they're doing this? Yeah. Um, yeah. And and which is the point of this podcast? I have yeah. to say, I know we've covered a lot of different angles, but it was kind of spurred on by these questions. Why? Why is this happening now? Yeah, why would he do this? And and so it says, meanwhile, Landon Brophy, a disaffected church member and co-host of the Mormonish podcast, has suggested the building spree <laughs> is merely a vanity project for LDS President Russell M. Nelson. They're trying to dominate the skyline so everyone sees their power and wealth in the community, he told DailyMail.com. Well, there it is. You said it. But I, th I think we really think that when we look at the history of temples and temple building and the way it used to be and the vision and there seems to be absolutely no concession here, even though every day there's more and more negative press. And, and I've pointed this out before, but I'll say it again. For me, living here in Utah, when I drive down to your house, I pass at least seven different temples. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them I can see across the entire valley. Mm -hmm. I can see all of them. There's not one that I cannot see. They intentionally position them where they can be seen from everywhere. And what would be the purpose that you had to be seen by everybody? There can only be one answer that I can think of, of why you have to put it where everyone can see it and build them so big that they can be seen over everything else around them. And that is you're trying to demonstrate your power and, mm -hmm. and uh, your display of wealth. And they'll say, no, it's to call everyone to God. Everyone else that isn't of your faith doesn't need to be called to God. That only means something to you. It only means something to your faith. But you're, the very fact that you're saying, no, it calls everyone to God, you're saying it's calling everyone to come join our church. 
-hmm. It's telling everyone they need to come and, and worship at our at our location in this house. And that's what they're basically saying is, you know, we're the dominant religion here, and I see it all over Utah. And now they're trying to sell that same message uh, in other communities that we're uh, large players. And I think they see what the Washington, D.C. temple has done, mm -hmm. that they get to take all the VIPs through and show them and say how important it is because you can't miss that temple <laughs> if you live in Washington, D.C. You come around the freeway and there it is hanging in the air. Uh, and they're trying to repeat that in every community. Yeah, but it's not the same circumstances. And it's true in a recorded meeting that we got where the Curtin McConkie lawyers flew in to talk to the Fairview stake leadership. They did say something like that. They said, you know, when you look up at the massive walls and the spire and those that can't go in, maybe they'll want to go in or, you know, maybe they'll just be strengthened just by looking at it. You know, talking about members and maybe people who aren't members, you know, well, that's your perception. But other people do not feel that way. They don't have that understanding or that meaning that's been in Brained in us since we were toddlers about the temple. So it seems like there's no no sense of awareness of what others might feel, other religions, other points of view. No, there's no empathy at all. It's straight up. It's our way or the highway. And to be fair, that is a Mormon tradition. That's yes. how the mobs all started was because the church would move in. They were completely inflexible. They said, our God has said we must do it this way. And you all got to get out of our way while we do it. And yep. that's the same thing they're doing with the temples. <sighs> yep, that's very true. All right. I think we're almost finished here. Um, I think this, yes, this is a clip. So like you said, will they ever stop? Um, will they ever concede? And this is another clip from that recorded meeting where they describe the idea that, no, they must have tall temples if they bend on even one they're going to eventually end up with, gosh, it sounds like Hinckley era, era temples, right? Yeah. Smaller temples. That cannot happen. The brethren are emphatic. And so this is Curtin McConkie having flown in saying, we're not going to let that happen. We have a religious workaround. We can get the high steeples. We're not going to concede. We are not going to have the smaller neighborhood temples like we had before. So let's listen to this. You're right that we could take the spire off, but let me explain to you what may happen if we do that. Our fear is it's a race to the bottom, right? Because as soon as you reduce it 10 feet here, then they want 10 feet. And we hear this all the time. If you're talking to someone in Minneapolis, they talk to someone in Richmond, they talk to someone in Cody, then they, they want 10 feet, and then 20 feet, and 30 feet. And most of these buildings are built in residential areas. Well, across the United States, the typical residential cap is about 30 to 35 feet. And so we really are headed towards a 30 to 35 foot building if we start giving on those areas. So it's, you know, for now, the brethren have been very emphatic that we maintain that so that we have that reverence. And again, as symbolism for what that house represents, First off, that's not even accurate because to say that the race to the bottom that you'll end up with 30 to 35 no. foot temples, they don't right. have a 30 to 35 foot temple anywhere. Right. All of them are taller than that. Um, and even their steakhouses are 50 to 60 feet tall with exactly. their spire. And so no one's saying that they're not going to be 30 to 35 feet. They're going to be in the 40 foot high with a roof and then a spire that's probably under 60 feet. So they're going to be 60 foot tall buildings, which is not a race to the bottom. It's a race to uh, comply with the codes. Mm -hmm. You're not racing to the bottom. You're simply adjusting to the codes of the area you're building in. Like that's Tucson. not a race to the bottom. Like Tucson, like, right? Yeah, like Tucson, like mm -hmm. Tucson did exactly yeah. what, what Hinkley did. So it's not a race to the bottom. In fact, it's a compromise. To, it's not even a compromise. It's a. It's what you do when you move into areas. You comply with codes. You comply with regulations. You comply with the same regulations that the other neighbors and the other churches are complying with. Yeah, I mean, you're in this industry in a way you are. I mean, what would you do if you had, say, a boss, a big boss that said, I don't care what those codes are. You need to build it like this. I mean, how would you even handle that? Because I guess that's how they're looking at the big boss, God, 
through the prophet is telling even all these mid-level people who all say it's above my pay grade. Everybody says it's above my pay grade. Nobody can give an answer or make a decision, but how would you, how would you handle that? The big boss is telling you, you've got to. Well, that's above my pay grade. Ah, um, there you go. <laughs> what, what you find is you, you're not seeing the project managers out here. Yeah. You're seeing the lawyers out here Yeah. because it's a legal issue. And the project managers know I can't build it unless you can get me a permit. Mm -hmm. So they've called on the lawyers to get the permits because the project managers, the construction managers, they can't build it unless they have that. And they can't just randomly ignore uh, anything that's in the code. They can't randomly ignore what's uh, they can't randomly build without a permit. So that's why you're seeing all these lawyers here is because the, the, the people who build these buildings can't do it until the lawyers get them the right the hmm. right paperwork and that's why we're seeing such a mess because typically you go and you apply for it and you say here's how i'm complying with the code once you show you're complying with the code you get the permit but here they can't show they're complying with the code so they have to go through these special use permits and and start arguing and start trying to force them to give them a permit when they don't uh when when they're not hmm. meeting the codes that would authorize them to have one otherwise wow it just sounds so much simpler uh, in the Hinckley or Monson era, <laughs> where you would just fit into the neighborhood. Well, so it just seems different. so much more Christian. Yes, yes. In, in that, uh, yeah. you know, time frame. That's that's what all of the, most all of these people are Christian people, mm -hmm. or even if they're not, they're from a Christian, you know, they, they have kind of a Christian background in mm -hmm. that they uh, still believe in treating people uh, the golden rule, all of those Judeo-Christian, uh, you know, teachings. And that's all they're saying is, you know, go work within our laws and be good neighbors. That's all we're asking for. Pretty simple. But I think we're on to our almost second to last slide. The problem is, if you really do believe, as they keep saying over and over, and the lighted pen and the notebook, God is or Jesus is the one that's directing all this. So that means that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Jesus was okay with a Tucson temple with a dome that fit in. Now he's going to destroy a town like Fairview in order to get something with a spire. We're calling this flip-flop Jesus. If it really is Jesus, who's pulling the strings? Yeah, I, I, I mean, you have to look at this as one of two ways. Either uh, either President Hinckley and President Nelson are two men who have two completely different ideas and they're following their own agendas and their own ideas, or you have to believe that Jesus is bipolar and is actually <laughs> giving them the the telling them how to how to run the church, but he keeps flip flopping depending on who he's talking to. One guy builds small temples, the other guy builds tall temples. You know, one guy, it's Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The other guy, it's the Mormons. I, I mean, I I can't come up with any other idea. You know, G, the Mormon Jesus is a flip-flop Jesus. He changes based on whoever's in charge. Hmm. Yeah, I love this AI so much that I had to put up another one because I just, <laughs> I literally typed in flip-flop Jesus. And this is, look at the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. It is very confusing. And all of our residents that we work with all say, why? Why? And we can't even really tell them. Some of them kind of see it. They go, yeah, I understand it would probably be hard to back down now. Once you've told everybody that God and Jesus want it there, it's hard to dial that back because, you know, they want it, they're going to get it. So people are very confused. But they don't have to worry because Jesus could flip flop at any moment and tell them right. uh, that uh, he wants it done differently now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's done it in the past with the name of his church. He's done it in the past with polygamy. Uh, he's done it in the past with blacks and the priesthood. Now he could do it with temple heights. I think that's true. Oh, and you have that interesting story as we close about the November 15th policy, which was one of the most egregious, I think, examples of flip flopping within, you know, a short span of years. 
Yeah, with and great for those harm. who don't know the November 15th policy, basically the church came out that said uh, any uh, children of anyone who is uh, gay and is in a same-sex uh, relationship or a same-sex marriage, if one of your parents is in a same-sex marriage, you cannot be baptized, you cannot uh, progress as far as the young men uh, receiving some of the ordinances that they typically would receive, um, that that you couldn't do that anymore. And that sat completely wrong with me. It was completely contradictory to everything that I'd learned about, uh, that you know, God doesn't punish you for what your fathers did, but uh, this that it seemed to be exactly what they were we're doing here. And I tried to understand this. I tried to, to, you know, figure out why this uh, was, was being commanded of me. Or you were an active member me. at that time. Yeah, I was you an active, active member LDS, at that time. And you wanted to do what the prophet said. And I heard some stories that made me change my mind. Uh, and, and I said, you know what, church, you're wrong. This is not right. This is not from God. God would not command this. God would not tell us to do this or to treat people this way. And so I went in and I had a talk with my bishop and I told him, I cannot support this. I said, this is not the way that God would, would behave. And the bishop, very nice guy, we spent hours discussing it, but he went through all these things and told me, you know, that I had to, uh, you know, the brethren had their reasons and he just defended and defended the policy. And I just said, I, I just can't, uh, I can't do that anymore. And I left his office and that was on a Sunday. And the very next Wednesday, they repealed the, dis the November wow. 15th policy. So here, uh, here, the poor Bishop, is experiencing flip-flop Jesus. Yep. He's there defending it one day, and the next day, on order of the church, he all of a sudden has to flip-flop the belief and tell everyone, no, 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 now you, now it's okay, now we can do that, and, and uh, you know, Jesus was wrong, but now he's right, you know, I, I, and it was never the brethren, you never accuse the brethren of being wrong, it was Jesus who changed the, the doctrine in the first place, and then he changed it back. Perfect example of flip-flop Jesus. And uh, that seems to be what we're seeing with the temple building. Right. And what you see then is the members saying, oh, thank goodness. I was hoping that would change. I was praying that that would change. And But, it, but instead of standing up and saying, look, this is wrong. Let's try to figure this out, which you could do about the temple building. I'm guessing that if there is a concession or something happens, a lot of the members will go, oh, thank goodness. I didn't like fighting with my neighbor. I, I wondered, and we have heard this from even stake level people. Why does it have to be so tall? What do I tell people, right? Same as you going into the bishop. I don't agree with this. What do I say? They're given some answers to say, and they begrudgingly have to say it or teach it if they're stake level. But inside, I think they really want it to be different and they don't understand. Um, and some are standing up, some aren't. But again, a victim of flip-flop Jesus, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, that was another thing that drove me out of the church was uh, I was sitting in a Sunday school class and we were discussing the revelation, uh, the revelation on uh, <laughs> blacks and the blacks being allowed to get the priesthood, which I don't think was ever called a revelation. It's called the official no. declaration. They just yes. said, now they can have it. Yep. Um, but we were discussing that and people were just telling their stories. Oh, my mother always looked forward and she said one day they would come and they all waited and prayed and asked. And it was such a wonderful day when the blacks finally got the priesthood. And I'm like, that's when I stepped back and I said, well, how come nobody ever stood up and said yeah. this is wrong Yeah. and said they should have it earlier and took any initiative to say this is wrong and I'm not going to back it. If if everyone, if if hundreds of thousands of people in the church would have said, this is wrong, we're not supporting this anymore, they'd have had no choice but to change it. But instead, they sit and wait and wait and wait. And it's the same way with the temple. People, you know that this isn't true. You know these temple height things are not accurate. You see what they're doing to your neighbors. Step up and say, look, church, why can't we meet the codes and the zoning law, so we don't need to do a special use, uh, a cup, like we, why can't we do what we did in Tucson? Why can't we do what Hinckley taught? Why can't we follow that rule 
and be neighborly and kind and work through this rather than throw our lawyers at it and throw RELUPA and say, we have a legal right to do it when you may have a legal right to do a lot of things, but you don't, that's not the neighborly thing you do. And I would, I would argue you don't even have a legal right to do that. You have to adhere to the zoning codes of the locality that's there. And the neighborly thing to do, as they said in the earlier article, go talk to the neighbors. Even if you meet code, go talk to the neighbors mm -hmm. to see and get their ideas. The city planning guy who was advising the church had more common sense than the men that are in charge of the church who speak <laughs> with God. Whew. There you go. Yeah, we're passionate about this issue, aren't we? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, we've, we absolutely we've been involved are. with that and we've seen the hurt and the uh, that's pain the thing. and the firsthand. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. That's exactly it. So, wow, I think we've covered it. And it's been a really interesting kind of trip down memory lane to look at temples from the past. And again, I think we're not naive, are we, in in not thinking that there are things behind the scenes that might have gone on with temples of any era as far as getting them built and using influence. I mean, we know that happens um, even in that other era, but we just sensed a different vision of that time to work with people more. Do you think is that kind of what we're saying? I think because we're not naive um, not to think that there were things and things happening behind the scenes as we know, but and we want them to have their temples where they in yeah. in wherever they would like to build them. We're simply saying adhere with the co local codes, work with the local people, and you'll get the temples where you want them without the yeah. hatred and the fighting and the yeah. bickering and the lawsuits and the payouts and all the other things that are associated with it. God, it just sounds so horrible when you list all those things together, but that really is what's happening. And it's so unfortunate when it's supposed to be a blessing and it could be a blessing if it's done in the right way. So, wow, I think we covered it again. Every time we're like, let's back off from the temples for a little bit, something else happens, right? And we can't not talk about it. So <laughs> hopefully our viewers and listeners are along for the ride, right? Because it is pretty fascinating in real time. And to know that, you know, honestly, I hope that a lot of you viewers and listeners realize that you're making a difference too. A lot of you send us information or point things out to us that we haven't noticed before. And we'll podcast about it. We'll share it with the residents. A lot of you behind the scenes, um, you're, you're helping with this. You're part of this. You really are because a lot of you have the experience in the church and you understand what this is all about and you see the big picture. So we really appreciate all of you who are playing a big role in this. Wouldn't you say, Landon? Absolutely. And we're not done. We know there's no. there's lo uh, <laughs> there's decisions so decisions coming out on several yeah. of the lawsuits. Yeah. There's more meetings coming up in the next couple months. Yeah. We have a neat uh a neat uh, one coming out on another location where uh, the church was bullying uh, the locals. And uh, it's going to be really fascinating. You're really going to be interested. We're just trying to work out some of the yeah. details on that one uh, so that we can try to be accurate on that. Yeah, this one was hard to believe for me when yeah. I stumbled across it. I don't know. Yeah, boy, we can't wait for this one. Hopefully we'll have some time to do some more research. That's our issue, huh? We're so busy Always. podcasting that we can't do the research anyway. All right, please comment and let us know what you think. Do you do you remember a difference in temple building from maybe when you were younger in a different era and now? And why, like the residents ask, why do you think they're doing it? Why? You know, I'd love to hear everybody's opinion. Please like and subscribe to Mormonish Podcast. And if you'd like to be made aware of when new episodes come out, you can hit that notification bell and it'll let you know right away. If you would like to financially help support Mormonish podcast and all of our deep diving into temple busting and all those other things. We're a 5013C and we have a link to donor box in our show notes and on our Facebook page. And we really, really appreciate those of you, especially those of you that have set up a monthly payment. It's, a, it's just incredible. I just get those notifications on email and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'll always text Landon. Look, I mean, it's like Sally Fields. They like us. They really like us. <laughs> <laughs> that dates me to that reference. But no, you guys just mean everything to us and, and your support is just incredible. We just appreciate every single one of you. Uh, we have links in our show notes to our Mormonish merch store. If you'd like to get a Mormonish mug or a sweatshirt or something fun like that. And again, thank you everybody for hanging with us on this whole temple busting journey. It means a lot to us and it makes a difference to the residents in all these towns. I'm not kidding. They are aware of our viewers and our listeners and they know the part that you guys also play. So thank you very much. And we'll catch you next time on Mormonish. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. 
We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.